Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And over the last half decade or so on this channel, we have been investigating more Skyrim mysteries than there are tigers left in the real world. Seriously. We filtered through thousands of the most fascinating unexplained phenomenon in the Elder Scrolls universe. From the disappearance of the Dwemer to the mysterious symbols found on High Hrothgar, we've built an encyclopedia of bizarre items. A few months ago, in search of new ideas, I set about creating a giant list of every single mystery that's been featured on this channel before, and in doing so, realized that this was a perfect fit for an iceberg video. Icebergs, for those of you who have been living off the grid, are a video format where a list of related items are broken down into multiple tiers, starting with the most familiar items at the top surface levels, and gradually descending into more and more obscure and strange pieces of information as the topics go beneath the surface. Thus, over the last hundred or so days, I have been preparing a Skyrim Mysteries Iceberg where we break down every single mystery that this channel has covered, and dozens that we haven't, in such a tiered, digestible format. Originally, I had hoped to be able to accomplish this in a single, massive video that would go on for a couple of hours, but have since realized that such a video would, well, you know, last several hours, and actually might be a little too hard on my PC and editing software. So instead, today I am merely presenting you beautiful people with part one of what will likely be a three-part Skyrim Mysteries iceberg. Our great glacier has been broken into five separate tiers, and today we'll be breaking down the first two. So, without any further ado, let's do further and dive into this oh-so-mysterious franchise. Starting off Tier 1 with perhaps the most famous Elder Scrolls mystery of them all, what happened to the Dwemer? The Dwemer were, of course, a mysterious race of elves that colonized Northern Tamriel thousands of years ago. They were known for their incredible technological sophistication, something that far eclipsed any other society of their day, or even of the modern day in Skyrim. They would build massive cities and structures underground, earning them the nickname Deep Elves. Unfortunately, roughly 4,000 years prior to the events of the Elder Scrolls V, the entire Deep Folk civilization, every single member of their species, just vanished all at once, leaving behind nothing but their ruins and automated machinations. Well, Almost all of them vanished at once. In the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, we can encounter a character by the name of Yagram Begarn. He claims to be the last surviving Dwemer in all of Tamriel. Yagram believes the reason why he was spared is that at the time of his people's disappearance, he was out questing in a foreign realm of oblivion, and when he returned, he simply found all of his people gone. Like, someone coming back to a house party only to find it empty. Sadly, Mr. Begarn isn't really sure what happened either. He suggests that the disappearance likely has something to do with the Dwemer obsession with technology. Perhaps they just pushed the bounds of reality too far, or maybe they experimented with something that they shouldn't have and offended the gods in some way. Though, ultimately, he doesn't really know. And, as a result, neither do we. Next on our list, Bugs in Jars refers to the fact that in various seemingly unrelated locations scattered around Skyrim, the player can find miscellaneous items called Bugs in Jars. There's about five of these things in total, and each jar contains a different bug. The one at the Alchemist Shack contains a moth, the one at Dushkin Yall contains a bee, you get the idea. Now, at first glance, these jars don't really have an obvious purpose. They're not connected to any quests, and they can't really be sold for anything. However, if you take a close look at them, you'll notice that on the lids of each jar 
is a different series of symbols. As you can imagine, this drove the community absolutely crazy. Almost as soon as Skyrim released, and for several years afterwards, YouTube and Reddit were filled with theories about what these symbols could mean, and what these jars could be connected to. Could it be some sort of grand conspiracy theory? Some players even suggested they were connected to the disappearance of the Dwemer. I personally have to admit, even I was super sucked in and immersed by this. I spent hours trying to decipher them myself, and ultimately got nowhere. For many years, it was one of Skyrim's most fascinating mysteries. Alas, it wasn't until the year 2018 that we finally got some closure on this matter. And you're gonna be disappointed. YouTuber and God King of Australia, Camelworks, reached out to Bethesda level designer Ryan Jenkins on Twitter, and asked him for some input on this matter after the community met so little progress. Ryan responded by explaining that this whole phenomenon is meaningless. Apparently, back when Skyrim was still in development, some of the artists wanted to put these bugs and jars and symbols in the game, and had some plan for a story with them, but the level and quest designers on the team, who would be responsible for implementing said story, deemed it to be a half-baked idea that would require way too much work and throw them off schedule. So, they didn't go through with it. However, the artists left the bugs in jars in the game. How anticlimactic. At number three, the Ebony Warrior is a mysterious, ebony-clad character who will randomly appear and track down the player sometime after we've reached level 80, and offer us a duel. Now, the number of things that make the Ebony Warrior suspicious are simply too great for me to list in this video. This guy is pants on forehead weird. For one, he's huge, like he's about 25% bigger than the normal maximum height for a humanoid NPC. Um, he can also dragon shout at you when you begin dueling with him, for some reason. It's always been thought that dragon shouts have been reserved for dragonborns and the greybeards, but apparently he can do them too. Oh yeah, did I mention he's also, like, arguably the most challenging boss in the entire game, despite being a random encounter connected to no other quests? And when you finally defeat him, he's not even a Nord. He's a... Red Guard. What's going on here? Well... We don't know, hence the Ebony Warrior's inclusion in this video. As a matter of fact, a few months ago I actually uploaded a full 40, maybe even 50 minute deep dive on this character, and I encourage you to watch the whole thing if you're interested in all of the theories and whatnot, but ultimately my conclusion is that it's unknowable. He seems to have some Daedric connections and stuff which I elaborate on, but frankly, only Todd Howard knows the truth, and Todd Howard isn't talking. For number four, the town of Winterhold is largely an insignificant rural backwater, with a small population that's only known for the prestigious magical college that it houses. However, it wasn't always this way. Winterhold was once a massive, bustling city, with a tremendous population and a huge center of economic activity. But in the year 122 of the Fourth Era, just about 80 years prior to the events of Skyrim, a bizarre event known as the Great Collapse befell the town and changed everything. Over the course of just a couple of days, a series of devastating storms and tsunamis battered against the town, causing the majority of it to break off and simply sink into the sea a disaster from which Winterhold has never recovered. Interestingly though, as you can see, the college was somehow spared from this horrible calamity, and remained completely intact. Because of this, many of the town's surviving residents have become deeply suspicious of the college, and believe that the mages must have had something to do with the calamity that befell them. Though the academics themselves 
fervently deny this accusation, and insist it's all some kind of coincidence or something. Nonetheless, Winterhold is a strange place for several other reasons, and we'll talk more about it later on in the video. The village of Rorikstead is a small hamlet located just west of Whiterun. At first glance, it looks to be just as normal as any other place in Skyrim. It has a small population of some lovable subsistence farmers, some kids, some cows, some goats. You get the idea. But beneath this facade of normalcy, there seems to be something sinister going on in Rorikstead. You see, while the leader of the town, a man named Rorik, seems to be normal enough, he claims to have founded the settlement a few years back after surviving the Great War, if you sneak into his house and look behind some shelves, hidden away, you'll discover a copy of the book Spirit of the Daedra, alongside a couple filled soul gems. What's this doing here? Spirit of the Daedra is a very, very dark book. In fact, it seems to have been written by an evil Daedra itself, and it's generally only found in the possession of Daedric worshippers. Rorik certainly doesn't present as that. What's up? Furthermore, dialogue with some of the local farmers will reveal that Rorikstead produces way more crops than it should. Its harvests are uniquely bountiful by the standards of Skyrim, further suggesting some divine, perhaps Daedric, intervention. Sixth, after completing the quest Dragon Rising and using a Dragon Shout in any named location, it's possible for a courier to appear and deliver the Dragonborn a quote-unquote letter from a friend. The letter reads as follows. Dovakin, you caused a bit of a stir in, insert location, when you demonstrated the power of your Thum. Not everyone is anxious for the return of the Dragonborn. I, for one, desire to see you grow and develop your talents. Skyrim needs a true hero these days. After reading this document, the location of a new word wall will be revealed in your map, and a miscellaneous objective will lead you there. But what's not clear is who is this friend that wrote you said letter? Could it be Delphine, a member of the Blades? It seems unlikely seeing as she never confesses to being the author, and you can still receive these anonymous letters after meeting her. Why wouldn't she just tell you the locations of the word walls? Another potential candidate could be any one of the many members of the Greybeards, though they all seem quite reserved about your powers until you demonstrate to them that you're acting in good faith, so that's also kind of suspicious. No matter, the identity of this friend continues to be speculated upon ten years later in countless threads on Reddit and even new YouTube videos. Suffice to say, it is a great question. Next, what are the Elder Scrolls? Not like the broader franchise, but more specifically, what are the Elder Scrolls items that we encounter and engage with in the game? During Skyrim's main questline, we'll be sent by Parthernax to recover one from a Dwemer ruin. Evidently, the dwarves were trying to develop a machine capable of reading these pieces of literature, but it's unclear how successful they were and perhaps that had something to do with their disappearance. It's not obvious. We use this recovered scroll to very briefly visit the past while at the summit of High Hrothgar, though Parthenax doesn't quite explain how this scroll was necessary to go back in time or the mechanisms from which this is possible. He just says he needs one to do it, and voila. Later on in the Dawnguard DLC, Vampire Lord Harkin requires an entirely new Elder Scroll to fulfill his prophecy to quote-unquote blot out the sun, and it's up to the player whether or not you get that for him. Though, again, Harkin doesn't go into details regarding how this is necessary or why. Clearly the scrolls are important, I mean, they gave their name to the franchise and are fundamental pieces of some of the most important quest lines, though that importance isn't elaborated on. 
Perhaps the closest thing to an answer to this question we can receive is by Urag Gro Shrub, the librarian at the College of Winterhold, who we can ask, what is an Elder Scroll? And his response encapsulates the mystery. It would take a month to explain to you how that very question doesn't even make sense. At any point after escaping Helgen and before joining the Dark Brotherhood, it's possible for a Dark Brotherhood assassin to appear as a random encounter, track down the player, and attack you. Now, because you are the Dragonborn, facing this challenge shouldn't be that difficult, and the assassin usually isn't prepared for his job. After you've defeated him slash her, you'll discover a note in their inventory, titled Dark Brotherhood Assassin's Note, and it reads as follows. Quote, As instructed, you are to eliminate the Dovahkin by any means necessary. The Black Sacrament has been performed. Somebody wants this poor fool dead. We've already received payment for the contract. Failure is not an option. Signed, Astrid. So, the obvious question this letter beckons is, who is that somebody? Who placed this hit on our character? It's possible to receive this random encounter at literally, again, any point in the game prior to the player's joining of the Dark Brotherhood. So, theoretically, whoever this person was could have put the hit on you just after you left Helgen, or even before. Of course, being the Dragonborn makes you a person of interest, but literally no one, not even yourself, realizes this fact until the quest Dragon Rising. And again, you can get this note long before then. So, how could we have made such an enemy so early? Furthermore, I might add, it's really funny that despite authorizing a hit on you early in the game, Astrid herself will never make any mention of this during the Dark Brotherhood questline, she kind of just brushes that off aside and pretends it didn't happen. Oh, Astrid, how typical of you. During the Dawnguard DLC storyline, no matter which faction you side with, you'll eventually be sent to a mysterious plane of oblivion known as the Soul Karen in order to rescue a woman by the name of Balerica. The Soul Karen itself is a depressing realm of existence where the souls of all people who have been soul trapped are doomed to spend all of eternity. Well, in this depressing location, we'll have the opportunity to interact with countless spirits who are regretful of their fate and beg us for help, which we unfortunately can't provide. However, the real mystery here revolves around the rulers of this realm. You see, while most planes of oblivion are overseen by a Daedric god of some kind, Maroon's Dagon rules over the Deadlands, Shiagorath reigns over the Shivering Isles, but there's not really a single Daedric god that watches over this place. Instead, dialogue with many individuals here suggests that the rulers of the Soul Karen are a bizarre coalition of entities referred to as the Ideal Masters. According to one resident of the Karen, a dragon by the name of Durnevir, the Ideal Masters were once a group of human necromancers, who somehow became so powerful that they were able to forge this new realm by themselves, and afterwards ascended beyond their mortal bodies to become the sort of gods of this place. The game presents us no opportunity to interact or communicate with any of the Masters, though Durnevier suggests that the closest thing to a physical form they do have are these bizarre purple crystals we can see at the top of pillars across the realm. So the question remains of who exactly were these once powerful necromancers? Will we ever get a glimpse in future Elder Scrolls games? And what exactly are their own motivations and ambitions? Do they have relations with other Daedric gods or other entities? For now, all we can do is speculate. At number 10 on Tier 1, we have the question of what exactly happened to the Falmer. So, as you're probably already aware, the Falmer are pale, goblin-like creatures that inhabit many Dwemer ruins and subterranean caves. They are extremely hostile, and even blind, 
depending on their ears to handle their own navigation. However, they weren't always this way. The word Falmer actually translates to Snow Elf, and the Snow Elves were once a majestic and even seemingly quite beautiful race of, well, elves that inhabited northern Tamriel back before the humans arrived sometime in the Merethic era. Snow Elven civilization was said to be advanced, scientific, and arguably even more polite than modern human civilization. The change occurred in the beginning of the First Era, when tens of thousands of humans invaded Skyrim from the north, coming from a now lost continent known as Admora. Long story short, the Snow Elves were totally unable to deal with this new threat, and they were forced to make a deal with the Dwemer, who had their massive subterranean fortresses capable of protecting them. Apparently something was negotiated, and the dwarves agreed to house large populations of these elves so that they might seek protection. It was after seeking this asylum with their cousins that something fundamentally changed about the Falmer character. Some sources argue that the dwarves tricked the elves and actually had been planning to enslave them all along, and force-fed them a variety of funguses and mushrooms that fundamentally altered their character as a species, and turned them into these slave-like creatures that we see today. However, other authors and characters rebuke this accusation, and say that the dwarves were genuinely acting in good faith and had nothing to do with this transition. Nonetheless, the Deep Folk would eventually disappear in 700 of the First Era, leaving the Falmer alone to their own devices. Next on Tier 1, we have the curious case of Sadia's identity. So, upon entering the city of Whiterun at any given time, it's possible to find a small band of Red Guard warriors arguing with one of Whiterun's guards, who refuses to let them any further into the city. Evidently, these men are searching for a certain fugitive woman they believe to be in the area. This woman supposedly betrayed a great city in Hammerfell to the Thalmor, and caused unprecedented atrocities to befall its people. It's up to them to bring her to justice, and they need our help. This will begin the quest in my time of need. And long story short, we'll find out that this fugitive woman is a Red Guard character by the name of Sadia, who lives and works at the Bannered Mare Tavern in Whiterun. However, according to Sadia, these accusations are completely unfounded and she's actually a victim of unjust persecution. She argues that she's actually an enemy of the Thalmor, and the men who are trying to locate her are actually working with them and just lying about their story for sympathy. She claims to have done some spy work or something that ticked off the elves, but it's not exactly clear what she was doing against them. No matter, this leaves us with a pretty big predicament, as it's not clear who we should believe. If you side with the original warriors, they'll have you trick Sadia into leaving the city with you, and then capture her with a paralysis spell so that they can supposedly bring her back to Hammerfell for a free and fair trial. If you side with Sadia, she'll simply have you defeat the captors in battle and make her life a lot easier. Ultimately though, the choice is ours, and the answer is never really clear. Maik the Liar is a robed Khajiit NPC who very rarely may appear as a random encounter. When interacted with, Maik will say several bizarre quotes to the player before refusing to communicate any further. Take a listen. Maik wishes you well. Much snow in Skyrim. Enough snow. Maik does not want any more. Snow falls. Why worry where it goes? Maik thinks the snowflakes are pretty. Skyrim was once the land of many butterflies. Now, not so much. Maik is tired now. Go bother somebody else. Now, if none of that made any sense to you, well, that's the whole point. Maik just kinda spews off nonsense about whatever random stuff whenever you see him. Normally, we could assume a character like this is just weird. You know, maybe the kitty took a bit too much skooma. But Maik has actually appeared 
In every single Elder Scrolls game since Morrowind, and he always fulfills the same role. A rare random encounter who just spouts off hilarious and completely untrue stuff. One of the most emblematic Maik quotes, I think, comes from Morrowind, where, when asked about the dwarves, he'll say, quote, There is no mystery. Maik knows all. The dwarves were here, and now they are not. They were very short folks, or perhaps they were not. It all depends on your perspective. I'm sure they thought they were about the right height. In the Elder Scrolls Online, one of my favorite quotes from his is this. Maik always travels forward. This way, he is certain of his direction. So, you get the idea. He's a meta character. But for over 20 years now, players have wondered if perhaps Maik could be something more. Given his presence across over a thousand years of Elder Scrolls events, he'd almost have to be a divine entity of sorts by now. Could Maik be a god? Perhaps not. While Maik has become a sort of franchise staple, it's worth noting that his appearance has changed between the games. Sure, he's always a Khajiit, but his fur and even eye color vary depending on when we see him. In Skyrim, his coat is a sort of lion gold, whereas in ESO, he's a gray kitty cat. This has led some to wonder if maybe there have been several Maiks across history who have served in this purpose. In much of his dialogue across the games, Maik has claimed to have a father of some kind. But due to the nature of how he talks, it's hard to know if what he's saying is accurate. I suppose only Maik knows who he really is. And Maik is a liar! And finally, our last tier 1 mystery in this list concerns the Blackreach Dragon. So, Blackreach is, of course, a massive underground dwarven ruin located just beneath the Palehold. The location seems to be the largest Dwemer structure of them all, and it's home to massive cities, villages, scientific research labs, military sites, the whole shebang. It really is ginormous. Well, in the central city of Blackreach, you can find an artificial sun hanging over it. And if, for whatever reason, the Dovahkin chooses to just dragon shout in the direction of this sun, the following event will play out. Indeed, shouting at the sun causes a chime to go off and a dragon to spawn in and attack the player. This beast is a fire dragon by the name of Volthiriol, or Dark Overlord Fire, as his name translates to in the dragon tongue. And he's not attached to any quests or dialogue within the game. He's simply a sort of easter egg you can trigger by shouting at that sun. But the question is, how the heck did a Dova like this find his way into a ruin like Blackreach, which is underground? The only way to enter Blackreach that we know of is by using an elevator at Mizolft, which, <laughs> you know, I, I guess a dragon could theoretically squeeze himself into there, but it's not clear. Dovas do have a tendency to be immortal, so it's very possible that Volthiriel could have made his way into Blackreach with the help of the Dwemer when they were still alive. Maybe there was an agreement or something. But until we get any further information, that's just a theory. A game that's copyrighted. Alrighty, so that about does it for Tier 1. Those mysteries that we've just explored represent what I'd consider to be some of the most familiar and well-discussed in the community. Now that we're transitioning into Tier 2, we're gonna get into more intimate territory. You know, I think everyone's heard of the Dwemer and Maik, 
but Tier 2 content is less well documented. Stuff that's only known to those of us who spend our time researching Skyrim lore on the internet. So, here we go. Starting off Tier 2, we have the bizarre, curious case of Sibyl Stentor. So, Sibyl Stentor is the core wizard of Solitude, Skyrim's capital. Apparently, she's had this job for a very, very long time. Dialogue with her and other characters around the palace reveals that she's been the court wizard for about a hundred years, which, you know, you'd think is a little suspicious, but I guess nobody's come to that conclusion yet. Also, her eyes are bright orange, which isn't particularly normal. Oh, and she tends to sleep most of the day and is most active at night. You get the idea, she's a vampire. Now, the mystery itself isn't necessarily that fact. I mean, there's nothing to debate. She's, like, she's definitely a vampire, it says so in the game files. But rather, what the heck is she doing and why? You know, is she, like, genuinely just a vampire that really, really cares about the fate of Solitude's Imperial Court and is, like, doing this job in good faith? Or is there something a little bit more nefarious at play? And, I'll be honest, the answer's rather inconclusive. On one hand, she seems to definitely be keeping some secrets. During the quest, The Wolf Queen Awakened, the player will be sent by Jarl Elisif of Solitude to investigate reports of necromancy at a cave near the city. When we arrive, long story short, we confirm those reports of necromancy and discover that there's a particularly strong and powerful undead entity known as the Wolf Queen who's been behind it all, and whom we have to subsequently defeat. Well, while Sibyl Stentor doesn't really have a major role at all in this questline, at the beginning of it, she can be heard telling the Jarl not to investigate that cave, and insisting that everything's fine and there's no reason at all to send the Dragonborn to check it out. Take a listen. Then we will immediately send out a legion to scour the cave and secure the town. Hafengar's people will always be safe under my rule. Your Eminence, my scrying has suggested nothing in the area. Dragonbridge is under Imperial control. This is likely superstitious nonsense. Perhaps a more tempered reaction might be called for? Oh, yes, of course, you were right. Falk, tell Captain Aldous I said to assign a few extra soldiers to Dragonbridge. But beyond this very swift single line of dialogue, Sibyl Stentor doesn't participate in this quest any further. She doesn't go on to hinder our investigation or anything, and after we've defeated the villain, there's nothing at all we find that connects them to Sibyl. So it's hard to implicate her in any of this, and her opposition may have just been genuinely in good faith. Maybe she really didn't believe there were undead things going on nearby Solitude. Who knows? Well, definitely not me, hence the reason we are including this mystery on today's list. Next we have the Sky Forge. So, the Sky Forge is this ancient bird-shaped stone structure that has allegedly existed since well before the modern human settlement of Whiterun. Legend has it that when Ysgrimor and his famous 500 companions came to conquer Skyrim from the Snow Elves, the Skyforge was already there, and they were just as confused about it as humans are today. But not only were they confused, they were also intrigued. As it turns out, this structure, as its name also suggests, is the most powerful forge in all of Skyrim. And Ysgrimor and his buddies were so hyped to have this thing around that they built a new headquarters for the Companions right next to it, which is now known as Yovaskar. And it's around this building that the whole settlement of Whiterun eventually emerged as we know it today. During the events of the Companions questline, we learn that there is actually a hidden chamber underneath the Skyforge that the guild uses for these Daedric ceremonies to Hercene, and we ourselves use for our first transformation into a werewolf. You have to wonder, did Ysgrimor and his buddies see the same purpose out of this, right? You know, maybe it wasn't just the forge they were interested in, maybe there's some sort of dark mystical power within this underforge that we don't know a lot about. 
The book Songs of the Return, which documents the return of Ysgrimor and his 500 companions to Skyrim, tells us that after Ysgrimor arrived and took an interest in the Skyforge, he interviewed some captive snow elves about it. And those elves told him that they didn't know anything about it either. The Skyforge was a mystery to the Falmer as well. Not only that, but apparently the Snow Elves were afraid of it, as they believed it contained some sort of dark magical power. Hmm. So, we don't know how old this forge is, we don't know who built this forge, we don't know why it works the way it does, and we don't know whether or not it has a dark secret. Sounds like it absolutely belongs in this video. At number three, it's time that we talk about the Eye of Magnus. So, shortly after joining the College of Winterhold, the player will be invited to a field trip at the ancient Nord ruins of Sarthal. Sarthal, according to legend, is the oldest Nord settlement in all of Skyrim, and was even personally ruled by Ysgrimor for a time before it was attacked by snow elves for a mysterious reason, and the humans were forced to flee. It's argued by many Nord historians that the elven attack on Sarthal was really the spark that began Ysgrimor's conquest of all of Skyrim in revenge. Though, that's up to interpretation. No matter, during our field trip, the Professor Arnie Ulgain will ask us to go search for some certain enchanted artifacts that the guild's been looking for. During this search, we'll eventually be led to a hidden, never-before-discovered chamber of the tomb, where we can find a giant, blue glowing orb hovering in the air, protected by a small army of Draugr. What on Nern is this? Well, our professors have the same question, and they decide to take the orb back to the college for further investigation. Spoiler alert, but nobody at the college is ever really able to grasp the true nature of this device. All they can really tell is that it's old and brimming with magical energy. Shortly after this discovery, the chief Thalmor ambassador to the College of Winterhold, a high elf by the name of Ancano, will go absolutely mad and barricade himself in the college's main plaza, attempting to harness the magical energy of the orb for himself. Though even this is kind of shady, like, the game doesn't really elaborate on how the Eye of Magnus' magical energy is going to benefit Ancano, or even what his plan is if it's endorsed by the Thalmor, all of this is left grey. The player will be forced to put an end to Ancano's shenanigans in one final grand battle, which serves as the climax for the College of Winterhold's questline. After the elf has been defeated, Members of a mysterious order calling themselves Sigix will appear before the Dovahkin and explain how they're, like, time travelers or something and can't trust us with the Eye's power any longer, and they take it away for themselves. The Eye has grown unstable. It cannot remain here or else it may destroy your college and this world. It must be secured. Moncano's actions prove that the world is not ready for such a thing. We shall safeguard it for now. Thus is the fate of this sphere. It serves as the focal point for the entire college questline, yet there's so many questions about it that the game leaves unanswered. Like, for instance, what was it doing at Sarthal? Was it already there when the Nords decided to set up their city? Did they find it and bring it there? What were their plans with this device? Could it have had something to do with the reason why the elves attacked the settlement in the first place? These questions are left completely unaddressed. And again, not even the best and brightest academics in all of Tamriel are able to figure out how the orb's magical energy works. So, the Eye of Magnus really is Skyrim's quintessential geometric mystery. Next, during the Dragonborn DLC quest, Lost Legacy, we'll help some Skull Nords on the island of Solstheim explore the tomb of Valok the Jailer. Evidently, long ago, when dragons ruled over the realms of men, Valok the Jailer was the dragon priest in charge of ruling Solstheim. And so the legend goes, when Mirak attempted to overthrow the dragons and make himself king of the world, Valok the Jailer was the priest who stopped him in his tracks. So, this guy actually occupies a pretty important spot in the game's lore. 
nonetheless, when we finally clear the tomb and get to its final chamber, we'll face off against Veloc in his Dragon Priest form, and have to defeat him in order to complete the quest. The bizarre thing is, though, that Veloc doesn't wear a mask. As a matter of fact, he's the only named Dragon Priest in the game who doesn't have one. Why is that? According to the game's lore, every Dragon Priest was supposed to have been given a mask by the dragons back when Dovas ruled the world. The masks came imbued with magical enchantments that helped the Dragon Priests exercise their control over local populations. Yet Veloc, who is clearly documented as being in control of Solstheim, doesn't wear one. I might also add on a possibly related note, that not only is Veloc the only priest without a mask, but he's also the only dragon priest in Elder Scrolls lore who seems to have been genuinely benevolent and a good faith ruler over his people. The book The Guardian and the Traitor, when describing Veloc's rule, refers to it as, quote, by all accounts a time of peace and prosperity for the people of the island, and he is remembered as a wise and just leader. Maybe the reason Veloc doesn't have a mask is because he didn't need one to earn the respect of his people. He didn't need to use magical powers to scare and intimidate his subjects into following him. His own charisma and character did that on its own. No matter, we'll touch upon this mystery a little later on in the video, as we're not done with Veloc just yet. But for now, let's move on. Night Mother. So, since the Dark Brothers' founding in the Third Era, the guild has been led by a mysterious entity known as the Night Mother. During the events of Skyrim, she's depicted as the decrepit remains of an anonymous woman, who occasionally communicates directions and warning to the player at important moments. However, who exactly she is and how she came to occupy such a semi-divine role is one of the biggest mysteries not only in Skyrim, but throughout the Elder Scrolls franchise. There's a prominent theory that's given a bit of credence in the Elder Scrolls Online, that the Night Mother was once a member of the Thieves' Guild long ago. However, she deferred from the other members of the Thieves' Guild in a bit that she thought it was okay to physically harm and often <clears throat> eliminate people she was burglarizing. This led to her being kicked out and founding her own Assassin's Guild that would come to be known as the Dark Brotherhood. Another, arguably more substantiated theory that was heavily emphasized in Oblivion is that the Night Mother was once a Dunmer assassin from Morrowind, who was a member of a different guild known as the Morag Tong. At some point, the Night Mother decided to leave the guild and establish her own residency in Cyrodiil, where the god of the void and assassinations, Sithis, took a liking to her. The legend has it that Sithis married and fathered several children with her. However, when locals around the town she lived in found out about this unholy affair, they formed a mob and murdered the woman to death. Afterward, she was granted semi-divine status by the god, and the rest is kind of history. Finally, if you want to get really crazy, my personal favorite explanation comes from the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall. Now, it's important to understand that so much of the older, you know, Daggerfall Arena Elder Scrolls games lore has since been retconned and changed fundamentally. But nonetheless, in Daggerfall, members of the Dark Brotherhood do not worship a deity called the Night Mother. Instead, they worship Mephala, Daedric goddess of secrets and plots. Some players have proposed that maybe the Night Mother who we encounter in Oblivion and Skyrim is just Mephala in disguise, or an aspect of her divinity. It certainly would fit her character, I mean, this is exactly what she likes to do, but the lore itself represented in both of those games seems to conflict that idea, so it's unclear what's really at the core of her. Greybeer Age refers to the fact that we don't actually know how old the Greybeards are. I mean, they look, what, like, late 60s, 70s, 80s, somewhere around there? But there's reason to suspect their age may be, uh, a little abnormal. You see, spread all over High Hrothgar is a rather alarming quantity of Restore Health potions. 
Like, seriously, they're everywhere. Every nightstand, table, cupboard has one of these things. And given the reality that the Greybeards abstain from combat, they are staunch pacifists who don't foresee any of that in their future, maybe these elixirs could be going towards something else. Perhaps they're life extenders in some way. Something that a friend pointed out to me several years ago that I didn't think much of at the time, though is relevant to this, is that if the Greybeards are so old, if they're all at the end of their lives, you know, their hairs are are graying, they're really wrinkly, you get the idea, you'd think they would have some apprentices around, or they'd be making preparations uh, for the future generation to keep this guild going. Why are they so confident in their current numbers? And that could connect to this. Though, at the same time, I wonder if the writers would have liked the idea of baby greybeards anyway. Runil is an Altmer priest of Arke who lives in Falkreath and maintains its world-famous graveyard. He actually has a rather dark secret. You see, a couple decades ago, he actually fought alongside the Aldemary Dominion against the people of Skyrim during the Great War. And if you press him a little in dialogue, he'll even admit to committing some horrible atrocities that he now greatly regrets. But that's not why he's in this video. If you manage to build up a friendly relationship with him, he may offer you a radiant quest to go locate a diary that he apparently left behind in some old dungeon. Now, it's unclear what Renil was doing running around through old dungeons, but he really wants his diary back. And it says in there, he makes some incriminating admissions that he rather wouldn't be found out by anyone else. Thus begins the quest, Find Runil's Journal. And as you imagine, it's pretty much a generic fetch quest. You go to the dungeon, clear it out, open a chest, find the journal, and bring it back to him for a bit of a reward. Although, if you decide to open up and read Runil's journal before giving it back to him, you'll find that he's had some interesting dreams. Take a listen to this paragraph. Quote, 20, Sun's Height, Dreams of the War Again, but this time, something different. I was leading a small band of Aldemary battle mages on a mission deep into the heart of Imperial territory. We had drawn near our target, a supply depot outside of Chaden Hall, when suddenly, the sky darkened, a great shadow passed over us, and there was a roar so terrible it chilled my blood. Something was flying just overhead so huge and so dark as to blot out the sun. The dream changed then. I was here in Falkreath, performing a service for someone who had just passed away, though I don't recall who. From the corner of my eye, I saw a stranger approaching. I turned to look, but the shadow came again, and the roar, and then I awoke. Now that I reflect on the dream, I cannot help but wonder, was it a dragon? Why would I dream of such a creature, when I have never seen one? It seemed so real at the time, but now the memory is fading. What it means, I cannot say. Probably nothing. It would appear as though Runil has been having dreams foreshadowing the return of the dragons and the Dovahkin. But how and why? It may be insignificant, but I think it's still worth pointing out that this entry is dated for the 20th of Sun's Height, the seventh month in the Elder Scrolls calendar. Well, the events of Skyrim always begin on the 17th of Last Seed, or the eighth month of the Elder Scrolls calendar. So, Runil had this dream just over 30 days prior to the events of the game. Fascinating. Lost Continents refers to the fact that while all of the Elder Scrolls games take place on the single continent of Tamriel, there are several additional continents spread across the world that we just haven't seen yet. And many appear to have disappeared. We've already alluded to Atmora, a mysterious Antarctica-like northern continent that's said to be covered in snow and ice, and where the Nords originally came from. Oddly enough, nobody's been to Atmora in several thousand years. Some tales even suggest Talos was the last human to come from there. It's not obvious why there's been a lack of interaction with this place, though. 
Some sources suggest the oceans and seas between Tamriel and Atmora have just gotten so cold and frosty they're intraversible. Others argue that Atmora has actually sunk beneath the seas and completely disappeared. Yokuda is a massive desert-like archipelago said to be far west of Hammerfell. It's where the Redguard people come from, and evidently about 2,000 years ago, it too was sunk by the sea. South of Tamriel, there is said to have once been a place known as Pyandania, home to a people called Sea Elves, or Maumur. We actually get a lot more lore on the Sea Elves and interaction with some of them even, during the events of the Elder Scrolls Online. Their continent is said to have been jungle-like and seemingly Amazon rainforest-based. But you'll never get this, that continent has also been lost to the sea. Finally, to the far east lies perhaps the most famous of all the lost continents, and the most speculated on, Akavir. Akavir is apparently the most Tamriel-like of them all. It's apparently of similar size to Tamriel, and also contains a similar level of biodiversity in different climate zones for different species to muster. Believe it or not, in the early Third Era, the Emperor Uriel Septim VII attempted to conquer the region. He mustered an army in the tens of thousands, with hundreds of vessels, and took off from Morrowind, landing on Akavir's western coast. And he was never heard from again. That was the end of that emperor, and it begot an entire crisis back at home. Survivors returned with stories of snake men, monkey people, and ice giants. The book Mysterious Akavir elaborates a little bit further on the races and terrains of this location and I recommend you give it a read if you're interested in the further lore. Unfortunately, while we may know more about Akavir than Yokuda or Pyandania, that's still not a lot, and this location remains one of the most mysterious and speculated upon places in Elder Scrolls history. At number 9 for Tier 2, this one's actually pretty easy. We have the Ancient Dragonborn. So, during the Dragonborn DLC, we can learn a new shout called Dragon Aspect. And once we learn the third word of the shout, we'll have the ability to summon a mysterious character called the Ancient Dragonborn to help us in combat for about 60 seconds. But who is this Ancient Dragonborn? He has many unique properties. For example, he doesn't respond to damage at all, like, when enemies try to attack him, they just go right through him, nothing changes, which is uncommon even for divine beings in the universe. He also wields an ancient Nord Hero Axe, a type of item that could have only come from the Skyforge in Whiterun, and he himself wears Dragonbone Armor, implying he may have lived as far back of a time as when men and Dovas shared the world together. Our next question is just what exactly makes Nernroot so special? As you already know, Skyrim has a huge variety of different plants in the game. There's juniper berries, canis roots, dragonflowers, wheat, cabbage, you get the idea. But amidst all those different plants, Nernroot has always stood out as uniquely exceptional thanks to a number of unique characteristics the plant possesses. Most notably, it possesses its own unique sound. Take a listen to the Nernroot hum. While it's easy to write off as just an interesting effect, this could be rather significant. You see, in the Elder Scrolls universe, there is this all-important concept of tonal magic. Tonal magic is the ability to manipulate or change or enact some kind of force upon the world around you with certain sounds. An example of this concept would be the dragon shout that our player gets to use. But it goes a lot deeper than that. The Dwemer and certain other groups in Tamriel believe the universe is really a sort of song, something that can be musically articulated. And their idea is that by adding the right notes, so to speak, to this song, it can be fundamentally altered, and perhaps to their benefit. 
Given the omnipresent nature of this concept in the Elder Scrolls universe, I think it warrants taking the sound of the Nern root a little bit more seriously. It might signify something greater. Now, those of you who played the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion might remember a High Elf named Sindarian. Sindarian was a full-time Nernru researcher, and we would be able to collect and sell him Nernruts at an outrageously marked-up price. Well, in Skyrim, which takes place a couple hundred years after the events of Oblivion, we can actually find Sindarian's skeleton at the bottom of Blackreach. According to his journal, which is right next to Sindarian's remains, he took the trip from Cyrodiil down to Blackreach in order to study the crimson Nern roots that can be found here, and he was trying to figure out what was causing them to have their unique color. In this journal, he also mentions something called the Sun's Death Event of 668 of the First Era. Evidently, something happened that caused the sun's light to stop reaching Tamriel for almost an entire year. Sindarian claims that before this event, Nernroots were much, much more abundant, and they even used to glow a different color. Apparently, they were a yellowish-red hue rather than the bluish-green of today. Now, it's not exactly obvious what this sun's death event was, the year 668 of the First Era almost perfectly coincides with the disappearance of the dwarves, so it's very likely there's some relation, but it's not exactly clear what that is or what's causing the changes to the Nernroot's biology. I guess we'll have to wait for Sindarian's child to appear in the Elder Scrolls VI. Next, this one's rather quick. So, you know Heimsker, Whiterun's priest of Talos, the guy who goes, let me show you the power of Talos Storm Crown. That guy. Well, many players have noticed that inside of his house, he has an alarming number of human skulls just sitting on display. This is odd, because Talos worshippers obviously don't require human remains for their ceremonies or sacraments. Those are more often than not associated with Daedric beings. But, on the other hand, we don't really know much about Heimskir's past or his narrative, other than that he really, really seems to like Talos. Furthermore, if you want to see these skulls, make sure you break into his home before the Siege of Whiterun mission in Skyrim Civil War, as that will destroy the place and render it inaccessible. Sleeping Tree Camp is a giant's encampment located far west of Whiterun. Its name derives from the fact that at the center of the encampment, is a large tree sitting in a mysterious, purplish pond. Further examination of the site will reveal this sort of spigot-like device on the tree's trunk that you can use to get a unique potion called Sleeping Tree Sap from, which massively rejuvenates your health by 100 points, but slows your character down a little for 45 seconds. What's causing this tree to produce such magical sap has been a topic of debate for well over 10 years now in the Elder Scrolls community. And believe it or not, a consensus has actually emerged. You see, nearby the Sleeping Tree camp is a small cave, and inside of this cave we can find the remains of a bandit with a letter in his inventory. This letter explains that the bandit came to the camp to steal some sap so he could sell it to Yisolda, a merchant in Whiterun. If we go to Whiterun with this note in our inventory and confront Yisolda about the sleeping tree sap she's buying, she will admit to it, and she'll also reveal that many people believe the sleeping tree quote-unquote fell from an island in the sky. Take a listen. How the tree came to grow there is a bit of a mystery. Some say that when Vardenfell erupted, a piece was blown to the middle of Skyrim and from the crater grew the tree. I've also heard that it was a spore that fell from an island floating in the sky, but that just sounds like nonsense. The island in the sky that she's talking about very likely refers to Umbra, a floating island that plays a major role in the Elder Scrolls novels written by Gregory Keyes. 
The Elder Scrolls novels are set during those 200 years in between the events of Oblivion and Skyrim, and a central theme of both books is this great floating island called Umbra moving all around Tamriel and just causing chaos everywhere it goes. It doesn't just fly over places, it has a tendency to also absorb and kind of feed off the energy of the organisms it travels above, so it's doing a lot of damage. However, it's mentioned that the island itself is home to these unique trees that have a particularly valuable sap. So, it seems very plausible that the Sleeping Trees inclusion in Skyrim is one of the game's very, very few sort of easter egg references to the novels that technically predate it in the game's lore. Or at least, that's our best guess. For our next mystery, we're heading on over to the city of Windhelm and investigating its largest inn and tavern, Candlehearth Hall. You see, this location supposedly derives its name from a candle that has been burning within the lodge for 163 years consecutively. According to the inn's current owner, her great-great-great ancestor of some sort was a man named Vundheim, who went off to battle and unfortunately never returned home. In mourning, Vundheim's son lit a candle in his honor, and that candle simply never, ever burned out. And nobody knows how or why the flame still lives. Did you see the candle above the fire upstairs? It was lit 163 years ago, back when this building was the home of a grand warrior named Vundheim. When word came that he'd fallen, his son Durot lit the candle in his honor. Nobody knows why it still burns. As a side note, I just want to point out, I find it hilarious that this is, you know, basically a limitless supply of energy and this random Nord family just has it in their attic, like, oh yeah, that's the SCP we keep upstairs, you want to see it? <laughs> anyway. And finally, last on our list, we have the blank word walls. Essentially, in three separate locations across the Elder Scrolls V, we the player can find, well, you know, word walls that are entirely blank. These three locations are Sovngarde, the Throat of the World right at the summit, and the Solcarn. As you might imagine, the meaning and function of these objects is very difficult to discern. We know from dialogue with Parthenax and several books that word walls were essentially tablet inscriptions that the Dovas made themselves. That's why Dovazul, the language we see used, looks so similar to, like, Mesopotamian clay tablets. It's the dragons just scratching in things with their claws. So, you have to wonder, were these word walls once used for something? Did there used to be inscriptions on all of these, but they got filled in? Or did these word walls get built, but they never found the time to write their edicts on them? Another idea that I don't see discussed very often, but I think may be even more plausible, is that this could be related to cut content. We know Bethesda cut dozens and dozens of Dragon Shouts from the game before release that are now only accessible with console commands. These word walls could have possibly been a conduit for any of those. Or, well, maybe they just look kinda cool. Anyway guys, that about does it for part 1, tiers 1 and 2 of what will likely be a 3 or 4 part Skyrim Mysteries Iceberg. If you made it this far in the video, thank you so much. That does, not only does it do wonders for the YouTube algorithm, but it's also just, you know, super creatively fulfilling, right? You know, knowing someone uh, made it this far in such a project. So, thank you again. I would like to tell you guys you could expect part two um, next Saturday or somewhere around there. That's where I'm going to shoot for, but oftentimes these projects just take more time than I'm prepared. So maybe don't hold your breath. Maybe the week after next. We'll see about that. But again, I, I really appreciate you guys' support, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone. Bye.